Hello and welcome to this Maritime London webinar. Uh, I'm Josh Standerwick, Chief Executive of Maritime London, and I'll be moderating today's session, exploring what has changed in shipping media and PR during the pandemic, and what the future may hold for PR and comms in our industry. Uh, we've got a great lineup today of both journalists and PR professionals, so poachers and gamekeepers, if you will. Uh, and I've got no doubt that this will make for a spirited, but of course, ultimately collegiate debate. Um, joining us from all the way from Singapore, thank you for joining us in your evening, Marcus. It's much appreciated. We've got Marcus Hand, editor of Sea Trade Maritime News. Uh, we've got long term a Maritime London uh, PR partner, Bill Lyons, director of Navigate PR. Uh, one of our newest members uh, in Ben Pinnington, founder of Polaris Media, and I think soon to be published author on this very subject. So I'm sure Ben's going to have lots of very interesting things to say. Uh, and joining us all the way from Northumberland, uh, evidencing her steadfast commitment to the shipping industry, that she even joins webinars while she's on holiday, uh, we've got Janet Porter, chair of the editorial board at Lloyd's List. Um, before we get started, uh, I'll provide a, a quick run through of housekeeping notices. Uh, you know, we're all very well versed in this now, uh, but if we do experience any technical difficulties, uh, please do bear with us. Uh, we will do our best to minimise uh, background noise, but um, I'll warn you, Janet is in the middle of a working farm. So if you hear any livestock in the background, uh, don't be panicked. Um, this webinar is being recorded uh, and will be made available on Maritime London's YouTube channel. Uh, and we'll, of course, send a link to all participants. Uh, and lastly, but importantly, uh, you will be able to ask questions in the text box. Um, and I will try and weave in as many questions as I possibly can during our hour long session. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's fair to say that the, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the fragility of global trade and the vital role, of course, of shipping and seafarers. And in this context, uh, I think that, you know, at least at least sort of subjectively, the it seems to me as if the industry has never been more prominent uh, in the mainstream media than it is now. I think this probably creates both opportunities and difficulties for the shipping industry. Uh, and in that context, I think it would be really useful to invite Bill Lines uh, from Navigate, who I think has got some interesting uh, stats for us, just to show how the industry has been taken up uh, over the last 24 months and how it's how it's changed uh, in, in that time in, in the context of the mainstream media. So Bill, I'll pass over to you now. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we'll take it from there. So Bill, thanks very much. Well, thank you, thank, thank you, Joss. And, um, yeah, thank you for, for inviting me to, to, to present. Um, when, when I was invited to present, I thought it'd be helpful maybe to set the scene a little bit. And um, we all talk about shipping and how it's perceived, etc. So I thought it'd be helpful to back it up with some facts and figures. Um, so I did a quick and, you know, a fairly quick and dirty uh, search uh, looking at how many English language articles have been in the media. Uh, since January 2018. So we threw in all sorts of search terms, vessel types, keywords, you know, like containers, and, um, Baltic dry index, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what's quite interesting is that you see how everything absolutely spiked in March 2020, um, at the, you know, as, as COVID um, took off. And really here, what we were seeing is a huge, huge uh, amount of articles looking at particularly the cruise ships, people stuck on cruise ships, the disaster that was unfolding, um, you know, people getting sick, dying, um, the chaos that, that, that was happening. Uh, on top of that, then, of course, you had the impact on trade, question marks around what was happening. But really, it seems that it's everything that, we, that we've been looking at here um, just sort of came, 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 through, came through in March. So it's the issue on the crew. Um, the issues on crude oil, the drop in crude oil price, and the impact on freight rates, the impact on the container market, um, the Suez Canal, obviously, last um, in, in April this year. Um, climate change hasn't gone away. All of these things have been um, have been have been covered by the media, but it's really in March. It was just 
absolutely phenomenal. We've never seen anything quite like it. And even, you know, in the wake of the Ever Given um, back, in, back in April, um, the, the level of media coverage was still dwarfed by the, by the onset of, of, the, of the pandemic. So I thought that just, you know, it's, as I say, it's not an exact science, this. I'm not going to claim this is covering absolutely everything and you can, but it, it gives you a sense. It gives you a sense of the, the, the level of interest that's out there in, in, in the media. Um, if I could just ask you, uh, Joss, if you could just turn to the next slide here. Um, here I'm showing the sentiment. So again, I don't know how much to read into this, but again, the media monitoring systems um, use, they've taken every word in the English language and given it a score. It's either positive, uh, neutral, or, or negative. And then they just throw that, you know, do the analysis, take all the articles that are out there and, and decide if an article is positive or negative. Okay, it's not an exact science, but again, it gives you an idea of, this is looking at just this year, um, from the beginning of this year, of where the sentiment is. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a mixed picture. So again, I thought that would be just helpful just to throw these slides up, just to, to open the discussion. I'd be interested to hear the, the take on, on my other, on my other panellists on this. Thank you. Thanks for that, Bill. If I could invite the other panellists to join the screen. Um, I think that I think that Bill has highlighted something really interesting there, and I think, as I say, it, it backs up our sort of assertions in regards to how the mainstream media has engaged with the shipping industry, uh, particularly over the last twelve to eighteen months. Um, and as I say, I think that creates opportunities and difficulties. Is from one of the from one of the things that I've sort of picked up is that. You know, we're hearing shipping talked a lot more in the Today programme and in and in the broadsheets, etc. Um, and we can't expect mainstream journalists to be fully across the the complexities of the market. Uh, and I suppose my question to the panel, off the back of what what Bill has presented, there is is how do we work to ensure that mainstream news providers are, are accurately accurately reporting on events within our sector? Um, and Marcus, why don't I why don't I start with you on on that one? Um, I think it's actually that's a really good question, and I think it's actually one that's quite difficult. I think because the sector is actually quite insular, there's this there's this tendency that people kind of talk shipping to each other, and when they go out and talk to the mainstream media, they still talk shipping. They expect the mainstream shipping media to know the difference between a bulk carrier a tanker or a container ship. Frankly, they don't, they probably don't care either. Um, so I think in certain senses, you've got to take things to, down to a lot more basics. You've got to, you've got to tell a story that relates to how important uh, the world, it is to world trade. You've got to kind of have that sort of take it, strip it back to that sort of understanding, uh, you know, and, and, and tell a good story. There is a really good story to tell about how shipping supports global trade and all of that. And it needs to be sort of, um, brought into that. I'm, I'm looking here very much at the commercial side of the shipping rather than, say, cruise, because uh, that's what I cover. Um, and, and I feel that it's, it's very much about being able to tell that story if you're looking to mainstream media rather than getting into and, and bringing in the human element, which I think, especially with the crew change crisis has been uh, so, you know, so important is bringing in that human element and humanizing the story. It's not, it's not just about money as well. It's also about human lives, people missing family events, people being stuck on ships when they were supposed to be married, all these things. Are, so there's all these great human stories that you can bring out. And these, you know, these, these, these can make a, a really good story in mainstream media. And I've, I, I, I personally know some freelance journalists who've done this with, with the mainstream media in this part of the world. And sort of, it, it does really work. Um, so that, I, I don't. That's that, that would be my take if you're looking at how to tell the story, and how to talk uh, to the more mainstream media. And Ben, I suppose you know uh, one of your roles is work, advising clients on how to disseminate complex news to people who don't have time, or as Marcus says, the inclination. I suppose to 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 really understand the the inner workings of the shipping industry. Um, what's your what's your take on on how how the industry needs to engage with the mainstream media? Well, I, I absolutely agree with Marcus. I mean, we have to start telling the human story. And before I worked in maritime PR, which I've done for the last 10 years, I worked for 10 years as a journalist and in political PR. And when I got into maritime PR, 
I, I was really amazed by how inspiring it was. Uh, we were working at Camelhead Shipyard uh, on Merseyside, and just to walk into a shipyard and see ships being built and the passion of the place. I mean, Maritime, without a doubt, has some of the best stories to tell. But the great paradox in the, in the industry is that we're not very good at telling our story. Uh, and particularly shipping lines prefer a lower profile, a more discreet profile. And whilst there may be uh, a lot of common sense and good reason for that, it's becoming an increasingly untenable position. And I think this era of PR being seen as an add-on to marketing or communications gloss or a tactic is really over. Uh, PR needs to be in the C-suite and it needs to be shaping the strategic direction of the organization. And how does it do that? It does that by listening more, more than just broadcasting our message and expect, expecting stakeholders to believe in it and become advocates of our message. We have to show that we are listening to stakeholders and we are be, being influenced and becoming an advocate of their message. And I think really there is a need for maritime, the maritime industry to come together like a rising tide and improve the standard of, of communications and get PR into the C-suite. Ben, thanks for that. And I think you've raised a number of, of interesting points which we can elaborate on as we as we get into the webinar today. Um, you know, Janet, uh, I suppose a bit like Marcus, you are uh, a news provider for the industry, uh, and I'm sure that uh, you know mainstream news providers lean on Lloyd's List quite heavily when they are reporting information on the industry. Uh, and how do you find that engagement with with the mainstream media? And you know, what do you feel the role is for for the news providers within the sector to ensure that the information being reported on is is accurate? Well, I suppose I'd like to just go back to some of the earlier comments and say I totally agree. I think shipping has got a fantastic story to tell. I think the pandemic was a completely missed opportunity in many ways because, you know, right at the beginning when we had lockdown and, you know, factories are closing down, um, the economies seem to be um, in free fall, but we didn't run out of anything. We didn't even have a shortage of toilet papers. You know, it was toilet paper. Everything continued to flow, and that's largely because of shipping. But the people who got the credit for it were the supermarkets, it was Amazon, maybe the airlines, but nobody really, you know, the shipping might have got mentioned in the mainstream media, but nobody really gave credit to the container lines and the tankers and bulk carriers which are keeping things flowing. And I think that's really the reason why the industry hasn't been able to sort out the crew crisis, because it doesn't really, it doesn't really relate. Most people, let's say, in, in Britain or North America or Europe don't really relate to shipping. They don't know who the shipping companies are, and that's because ship may be owned in one country, chartered from another, and classed elsewhere, and flagged elsewhere, the crew from another country. So nobody relates to it anymore. So I think that's the problem, getting the story told, because nobody knows quite who who to go to, and who is the spokesperson, or is there is there an industry figure which everybody can relate to? So getting back to the, uh, the mainstream media, um, Obviously, they have been writing about logistics, they've been writing about the ever given and been writing about the crew crisis, but the crew crisis hasn't been resolved. And I think that shows that shipping doesn't really have the influence that it thinks it has and should have. And um, as far as the mainstream media is concerned, um, in the past, all the daily papers in the UK, for example, used to have shipping correspondence and they don't anymore. They'll have transport correspondence and those transport correspondents are mostly concerned with road and rail and air ferries may be, and cruise ships when their readers are stuck on them. But this is the problem. The mainstream media is not all that interested, except, you know, when there's a really good story like The Ever Given, with fantastic, fantastic photos. Yes, of course, they will, they will focus on it then. But for the most part, as I think we all know, it is an invisible, largely invisible industry. And even though I've been writing about it for many, many years, I don't really see how it's going to get out of this when it's such a instinctively secretive industry for the most part. I'm not sure I entirely agree that it's that it's an invisible and secretive industry. I think I think there has you know the, the, there's been a huge amount of press coverage. I think the the, the campaign to 
to highlight the plight of crew on the ships was was huge. I mean, that that was huge. That was on the front pages. That was on the in the very well covered. It didn't resolve the situation, but it's it's certainly from a from a uh, communications perspective, it was it was done very well. Um, I think the the story of freight rates, supply chains, uh, shipping is is very much very much uh, out there. Um, certainly, I mean, shipping is clearly a very diverse industry. What are we talking about offshore shipping? Are we talking about cruise? Are we talking about container lines? They're all distinct sectors in them in themselves, um, and there are there are leaders in each of those sectors. Um, I think there are. There has been, you know, there has been front page coverage. Certainly, I mean, I've been in this business for about 15, 20 years. I've never seen anything like it in terms of the level of coverage in the past few years. And it's it's changed. And we're not even talking about social media here. Uh, we're just talking about the, the, the mainstream media. So I think I do. I don't totally disagree with what you're saying, Janet, that, you know, does the average person on the street understand exactly how? how their product got here and you know that was it wasn't just about amazon i agree with that i do i do agree with that but i do think in the same breath i think there is a certainly in the business pages uh there is a lot more coverage of of, of shipping um and yes no but the average person on the street it is a complicated very complicated industry i would also probably suggest that most industries feel the same but nobody gets them nobody understands our industry I'm in the chemical business, I'm in the sewage business, I'm in the whatever business it is. Nobody gets what I do is so important and critical to our way of life. It's complicated. It is a complicated business and it's difficult to, to get that across. And, and I, no, I agree with that. It is complicated and everybody likes to think that they know their industry better than anybody else. And I don't. It, I think part of the problem of getting a lot of stories into the mainstream press is because there is a very active trade press as well. And that's, you know, in a way, the mainstream media feels they can't actually cover it as well as maybe, I say, Lloyd's or Sea Trade or Tradewinds or whatever. And I don't think there are many other in industries who've got such an active and diverse trade press of shipping. So I think that may be one of the issues. But it is an instinct, for the most part, it is an instinct of your secretive industry. And I think, in a way, if I can name check Maersk, I think they're trying to change it. They are reaching out very successfully to the, the mainstream business press. And... Um, it helps that they've got they've listed as well. I think this is part of the problem. The FT or the Wall Street Journal, for the most part, is not going to write about companies that aren't listed, and so that's part of the problem. But overall, I think it is because it is so complicated, and ship owners do tend to duck for cover when things go wrong, which they shouldn't do. They shouldn't be afraid of standing up and saying, "Look, something's happened. We don't know what, but we're going to make sure we find out." You know, try to get to the bottom of almost any accidents. They're not reported. Uh, they're not reported in a timely fashion, if at all. That sort of thing. You know, makes people instinctively, I think, suspicious of the industry, rightly or wrongly. I mean, I've been writing about it for years. I think it's a great industry and has um, done a huge amount to keep global, you know, to help the global economy, globalization, which may be out of fashion at the moment, but I think it's a good thing. And I think shipping has been the driver of all that. But I still think it's not good at getting that story across, which is, you know, what we're, we're discussing today, really. I think, I think uh, Janet, you raised an interesting point there in using Maersk, uh, and I suppose they're, they're imperative to engage with the media more proactively due to the fact that they are a, a publicly listed company. Uh, and just to build on that, I suppose, um, in the context where you know, regulators, insurers, and, and indeed investors, uh, and not just vez investors working through capital markets, are, are demanding enhanced reporting uh, and transparency. Um, how does the industry become more comfortable, I suppose, with, with dealing with the media? Uh, and there's a subsequent question to that, I think, but I'll, I'll, I'll open that to the floor to start off with. And Marcus, why don't I, why don't I start with you there? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. There certainly is going to. There is this start to be a drive of transparency, in particular, I think, around the environmental aspect uh, with the industry. Um, I think one of the things that you talk about being comfortable with the press, the fact that the, a lot of the industry isn't even comfortable with the trade press, kind of expresses where the problem actually is. They're not comfortable with people who understand the industry, who are generally pretty friendly and understanding to them as well. Um, and if you can't even sit down with them with any confidence, 
you know, really going to struggle once you start, you know, going to an FT or Wall Street Journal or, you know, TV um, or whatever. It, it's so I think there's a whole sort of level of confidence that needs to be built. There are there are certain companies, Janet mentioned Maersk, and you're seeing I'm seeing a few other companies at the moment starting to adopt a more a much more proactive stance on certain things like the environment and issues. And MSC is another one a company who never used to say anything. We now seem you know, you see a lot and proactively talking about the environment, regulation, things like that. There are, you know, there are a number of examples like that of companies who seem to have understood that they, that, you know, that they have to engage in terms of the message and in terms of these issues in the industry. And not necessarily, you don't necessarily have to talk about your numbers as a business all the time, but actually talking about these, the talking about the things that the issues in particular, I think the environment comes in here. And obviously, in the last year, the crew change crisis, and sort of engaging on on these particular topics, and um, and telling, and again, telling that story. Uh, the the the, yeah, the, envi the environmental record of the industry. If you compare it to using trucking, for example, um, the environmental footprint. I mean, it's a, you know, shipping is a much more environmentally friendly industry, but that's not how it's perceived. Um, so it, it's it's. I think there's a whole series that needs to go through here of learning to talk to the media and, and and how to get that message across. And I think that's where people like the Bill and Ben here come in and, you know, to sort of bridge that gap between the two. Marcus, you've you've done my job for me and perfectly segued into into comment from Ben and Bill. So Ben, I'll start with you and then and then Bill. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think Marcus is absolutely right about the environmental issue, because this sort of gets maritime out of its bubble into this blinding harsh light of the climate change emergency crisis. So in a way, maritime organizations now have to engage the media because they have to show what they're doing to go green. And the IMO has made it clear that the maritime sector is responsible for emissions equivalent to a country the size of Germany. So that means that maritime organizations really have to be in touch with the bigger debate about green and influencers like Greta Thunberg, David Attenborough, uh, the Duke of Cambridge, it's quite possible that Maritime could get pulled into the debate. And uh, we see Greenpeace uh, protesting um, at ports around Europe, uh, which, which are importing coal. So it's not like Maritime can just disappear into the shadows or just talk within its bubble. We are now part of a much bigger debate and um, we see with ESG, the new environment social governance uh, agenda, which is sort of replacing CSR, that that is putting a lot more pressure on maritime organizations through um, things like the Poseidon principles, which is actually putting a lot more pressure on uh, shipping lines to go green in line with the IMO targets. So this sort of era of CSR and gesture, doing worthy things and expecting recognition, it's becoming much harder now um, with ESG. Um, the organizations, shipping lines have been told, you won't get a mortgage for your ship if you don't get your house in order. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a whole new climate and uh, organizations need to get all of their messaging right and all of their, their operations right. And that's why PR needs to be central not just this add-on, not just this tactics. It needs to be central to the strategic direction of the organization. Bill, have you got anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I, I would entirely agree with that. I would clearly there is now the there is a reason for a privately held company now to communicate and there is now an imperative to do so. So it's not just perfectly well run companies, perfectly sound companies that are doing a quite quite good job and that's the way most shipping companies work uh, quietly behind the scenes they're dealing with a handful of charters and customers etc haven't felt the need uh, there hasn't been a requirement to broadcast uh, everything that they do to the wider world but it's not good enough now just to do a good job you've got to tell your dudes explain how you're doing a great job and whether that's through the media whether it's through uh, the reports that you put out whether it's through the way that you communicate with your customers and uh, shareholders and etc etc it's a, it's all part of that drive but um, a point that was made earlier, um, I think Marcus made it about jargon, I think it's absolutely critical. Um, and that's the role of the, the communications teams 
is to explain what a bunkers are or what cape size vessel is or you know what what, what a flag state is etc etc all of these things that just seem pretty basic to you and i um are actually not that basic uh they are complicated topics and they do need to be explained and uh with, without patronizing uh that the uh you know the audience that, that you're, trying, you're trying to reach but it's um it's a, it's a two-way thing, and um, yeah, you've got to focus on your on your stories, and people are people are interested in other people, in human stories, and that that I think is where the industry struggles. There's been lots of facts and figures: there's a billion this, a million that, ten million. What's the difference? I don't know. I mean, it's to the average person, it's just a blizzard of a blizzard of numbers, and I think the people, you know, we've seen this just on on the crew side of things, the crew crisis, the huge support. There's been a huge good feeling um, towards the you know brave crew um, stuck on these vessels, and it's people sort of go, I, there's a human face to this. It isn't just some anonymous corporation moving a product from X to you know for X rate to you know for every, every, every day. Um, it's it's got something behind it. So I think that's the area that that the the industry could do um, work on improving. But it's it's it's. It's a big commitment of time and effort involved. It's not to be underestimated. Uh, Bill, I, I, I think that, that time and commitment piece is one that perhaps we could elaborate on a little bit. I mean, I'm going to play, I mean, there's, there's far too much consensus going on on this panel at the moment. Uh, and I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. And, you know, sometimes, particularly when I go on to LinkedIn uh, and I see a, a owner or operator stick their head above the parapet and, you know, give their views on a certain issue. Uh, and this is also true on the on the comments pages that you see and and you know and the broadsheets etc. Um, quite often, you open yourself up to a world of uh, uninformed, largely criticism etc. Uh, that comes in through various sources. Uh, and if I was one of those people, I might think actually, is there enough incentive for me to actually engage in this and do this properly? And how do I go about managing this sort of this quite often this barrage of criticism and negative and uninformed comment that comes into my business as a consequence? So I'd like to sort of throw that back. And I think this is both a, a social media and a general media issue, if you like, particularly in the context of the shipping industry. And Ben, you mentioned this in terms of, you know, Greenpeace, protest, uh, you know, uh, protesting outside port term, uh, coal terminals and, and this sort of mm -hmm. stuff. And how do we address that? Because we all agree that it's a good thing that we want to open up and be more transparent and engage with the media. But when you do, if you can't control in a meaningful way the, the the criticism that comes back i suppose that incentive is in some way diminished and ben i'll, I'll start with you on that one because i'm sure it's something that you've been considering well, I'm with not, your book, i'm not altogether sure i entirely agree with the premise because if you look at something like linkedin i don't think that there is a vast amount of criticism there i think the standard of debate is far better than say on twitter um and i think linkedin in particular is a key platform now. It has 730, 730 million users, half are logging in every day, but only, I think, fewer than 10 million are sharing any content. And I think that's the problem, actually, that there's not enough content being shared. And I know when, when I speak to executives that sometimes they don't rate social media, they don't like the debate on social media. And my message to them is really, well, show how it should be done then, you know, um, create content that is thoughtful, that is well presented um, and helps to your organisation to be better understood. Um, I think it's absolutely essential that organisations embrace the reach of social media and um, yes, you, you, you may get some kickback on Twitter, but you know, that's the nature of, of the beast, I'm afraid. and. You know, it's really how credible those people are who are making those comments. And I would advise clients to, to focus on reaching the stakeholders who have the most credibility. Janet, do you, do you sort of understand that anxiety point, I suppose, and perhaps a feeling that within the shipping industry, uh, it's quite difficult to win? Uh, quite frankly, in terms of these sorts of engagements, uh, and and do you want to do you want to comment on that? Um, 
I'd like to turn the clock back quite a bit, really, because obviously we're talking about Twitter and LinkedIn. And I mean, I use Twitter quite a lot just pr to promote you know, what's on Lois this. I've never had any problems, but my Twitter feed's probably extremely boring. But it is, it does, you know, get a fair amount of traction from time to time. But it's really explaining how the industry works. And many years ago, when there was more time and people were less um, less concerned, I think, perhaps about controlling the message. A lot of companies, I can name particular um, things like P&O Containers or P&O Ned Lloyd, would give little press briefings, background briefings, just to explain certain parts. We could discuss the, um, I know, the reefer trades or the Trans-Pacific trades or something like that. And Wallanius, the car carrier, used to give an annual press briefing in London just about the global car trades. And I learned a lot from those. Also, you got to meet people on a background basis who are like middle management. And like, for example, I first met Jeremy Nixon when he was a trade manager at P&O talking about Asia Europe trades, I think. And now he's the chief executive of Ocean Network Express. So you need to have, have that long term build up of relationships and confidence and trust, because trust, as far as the journalist is concerned, is really important or rather it's a two way relationship. So I have certain really senior executives who will talk to me and I'm sure Marcus does as well. They know it's totally off the record on background, but you know, they trust us to, um, you know, trust us with the information and that information is vital because I couldn't do my job without it. And I'm sure Marcus would agree. You've got to have those sort of, I know, deep throats or whatever, who are now really senior. But you can't be, I mean, it's obviously been very difficult over the past year to go. And I feel quite sorry for younger journalists now trying to build up their, their network of good, solid contacts who they may have for years if they stay in the industry. So it's building that long-term relationship, and it is, it is quite a long-term relationship. You can't just sort of decide, oh, I'm going to relate, I'm going to um, build better relationships with the press, and it won't happen overnight. So um, whether you do it when we're all allowed to have face-to-face -face conversations or meetings again or, you know, meet at events or, or off-the-record briefings, I don't know, or whether you do it through Twitter or social media, it's, um, it's a long-term, it's a long-term project really a long-term exercise to build up the relationships to the point when you know that you can get your story across and how to do it yeah no bill you go so yeah I, I would agree absolutely and it's 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 about building those long long-term relationships it's about showing people what you do and how you do it whether that's going into your facilities going on board the vessels going you know into the factory floor into the shipyard whether it's spending time in the boardroom with the senior executive team and it's not you know it's a two-way thing it's not just mm. about communicating when you want something oh look i've got this wonderful product or service i want to tell you about today what do you do when the news isn't so great uh, or you need some commentary of trying to explain what's going on in the, in the set that's also an important part of it I'd also say that, you know, it's harder and harder, as I think you alluded to, Janet, with the younger journalists, time. Again, it's a time, mm, it's not just totally. about it's accelerated these pressures. The average journalist now has got to keep their Twitter feed going, the social media feed going, they've got to generate news stories faster and faster. As newsrooms have been, you know, have been hollowed out. Um, you know, there isn't that level of expertise everywhere. Um, it's, it's a tough job being a journalist. And they do need the support of the, of the industry that they're writing about. So to get, so we can't expect them to be an expert. You know, I'm taking Lloyd's List and, and um, C Trades on the side, but you can't expect the non-trade press to be to, to be expert in your industry. You've got to tell that story and explain to them. No, and I think just mentioned something. I mean, you learn so much from just a ship visit or a port visit. Um, you know, it doesn't sound you're not you may not get a big news story out of it straight away, but you learn. I mean, it, the whole thing is a learning process, and it is a complicated industry. It's a global industry, which is why we probably all love it, but it is complicated, and um, you you there's no way you can just write a story. And, I mean really understand what's going unless you've got you know, a few years experience behind you to to know the background the context and how the industry works um so hopefully when things do get back to a bit more normality there will be a chance once again for people to go and actually physically see a ship i think once you've seen a ship it brings everything into into a certain perspective the scale of it you know and how you actually get all those con um, something like a big container ship how they actually get from a to b i still find absolutely miraculous but you know most people are just seeing the ever given stuck in the Suez Canal and, and don't think anything more of it except spectacular photos and they've forgotten about it now. 
most people have got no idea the story is continuing. But, you know, the trade press, we do continue with it. And um, it's really building up that, that level of knowledge and understanding and um, those personal relationships that hopefully CEOs will continue. When they get to that level, they will continue to have that relationship with their the journalists they've known over the years. I, I just want to build on that point. And it's interesting because um, in a way, it feels a bit like we sort of want our cake and eat it as well, because at the same time, and we've seen this, I think we've definitely seen uh, increased professionalism from stakeholders across the maritime industry in terms of, of how they engage with the media over recent years. We've certainly seen the growth of internal PR functions within the uh, shipping industry over recent years. Um, and that is a good thing. I am sure it's a good thing. But at the same time, uh, and this is, uh, you know, I'll direct this at Marcus to, to start off with. At the same time, is it becoming more difficult to access those C-suite executives, if you like, and have meaningful conversations with them about what's going on in the market? Uh, and are the messages coming out of companies for journalists perhaps, uh, you know, uh, more, what's the right word here? Uh, I, th I think I think it's fair to say perhaps slightly more anodyne than they would have been previously when you've just been able to pick up the phone to, you know, those three seat executives and they can give their, their honest appraisal of things. Um, Marcus, I'll, I'll start with you on that question. Yeah, thanks, Joss. Um, I think there is definitely a change undergoing at, at the moment. Um, I think as Janet sort of shared, if you go back sort of 20 years or something, it was because there weren't the PR people in general, there weren't these people, comms people and a lot of these companies, you either got to know the executives at cocktail receptions and things like that. You kind of had this quite, um, you know, you have this very sort of off the record type relationship with them or, yeah, that's kind of how it worked. And that was good and bad, uh, to be honest. It's got, it's got, it's got its really good points. Um, and I think you're seeing a shift in that now. You are seeing, as you said, a lot more sort of professional sort of PR setups being put in uh, to place in, in companies or using agencies. The thing is that, unfortunately, I think that what you what you describe as anodyne type messaging um, is the problem uh, that you're seeing as a result of this. Um, it's just being used by companies, and it's kind of indicative of how it's used in the stock market as well. Like, oh, um, well, these disclosure. Uh, terms mean that we can't actually tell you anything. So we'll just sort of finish you in a completely bland statement that says absolutely nothing. And uh, uh, can you kind of move along now, please, sort of level, rather than actually engaging. It doesn't have to be like that. I've covered, um, earlier in my career, I covered part of the aviation industry. And that had a much more developed uh, PR sort of uh, kind of communications type strategies. And you got, you got meetings with senior executives, you went for lunch with them. Sometimes it'd be on the record, sometimes it'd be off the record. It was, it was a lot more facilitated and structured than it's tended to be in shipping um, over the years. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that. And I think we probably all know who they are. And um, at the moment, I think there's a sort of a little bit of a crossroads onto that to me. Um, it's like, um, do you now, you know, okay, so you've decided, you've decided you want to, want to engage PR because you think you've got a message to get out. But if, if all that message is, is to basically say, this is our message and we have absolutely no other comment, that's really pretty much a total waste of time um, to, you know, to all and sundry. Um, and so it's about using, it's about getting out and talking to people. Doing, yeah, doing some of those off the record type briefings. It is harder these days. I mean, obviously the last year has been difficult for different reasons but it is hard on pressure of time um yeah if you tell somebody they've got to take an entire day out to go to a port the chances are they're going to say i'm really sorry i'd love to but i don't have the time um you know because i've got i'm supposed to file five stories to meet my productivity target by you know five o'clock um and that kind of level type stuff that unfortunately is the reality of the modern newsroom uh, so yeah um yeah, yeah, Bill. Bill, as a as an intermediary in so many of these conversations, have you got have you got anything to add there about that? I suppose that internal difficulty in regards to the increased professionalism of PR within the shipping industry, uh, and that access and honest engagement with top level executives. 
Yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? So on the one hand, the journalists, of course, they, they hate people like me. They don't want to talk to the to the gatekeeper. They want to go straight to the news source. And um, that's, you know, they want to get someone saying something they probably shouldn't be saying. You want to get that nice exclusive comment, something that's going to, to generate the headline. Uh, and, the, and, and, and the news, on the other hand, if you've um, properly uh, working with, with, with the clients and make them understand, understand you know what both parties are looking for we're trying to um provide something that's going to, to you know be interesting content we because i don't really care about journalists i care about your readers and your mm. viewers that's what i really care about uh, and what's going to make an interesting story and um you know and that's that is a that can be a challenge if people don't speak in human terms or to be too you know too rigid to the to the message etc unable to stray feel very uncomfortable Maybe they don't have the authority to speak. They don't really know what they can and can't can't say, etc. That that can that can be a challenge. But I think if properly managed, you've got your key messages. You can understand what it is you're trying to say, and you back them up with proof points. We're great because X, Y, Z. This is here are some tangible reasons. Here's some, you know here's some stories around that illustrate the point that I'm trying to make. Um, here are some facts and figures to, to to back that up. That that can be the challenge. The other side of the coins of course that as the client doesn't actually have to go through the media in the same way anymore um you know they can sidestep and go directly straight to, to straight to the audience through their own channels whether that's videos that they make or blogs or whatever it is and you're seeing as you alluded to earlier just this there is an explosion in this content there is so much out there that companies are putting out some of it's great some of it's terrible um and um that's you know, you're seeing a, you know, a lot more effort and focus being put on that. And I, you know, you're really seeing companies saying, we've got lots of different channels and ways of getting our message across. Media is one of them. It's one of many ways we've got of engaging and reaching our audience. It's a really important one, but it's not the only one. Yeah, I think that's a, yeah, sorry, Janet, do you want to, do you want to come in there? I was just going to uh, say, what is it? The, you've got to know, what is it, the story, or what is it your clients want to get across? Whether they go through the, the um, conventional media or, or not, uh, do they know exactly what they want to say? Because obviously when I have a, obviously when I have a conversation with a, or an interview, or whatever you want to call it, with say CEO, I don't always know what the story, I don't have go a plan saying, I want this to be my story. I want to have a conversation. And yeah, I don't always know where that conversation is going to go. And often it's, you know, as we all know, it's like the last minute as you're just packing up, that's when you get your story. And it's not, it's, you're not trying to trip anybody up. You just, you know, you have a conversation and both sides start to sort of enjoy it, hopefully. Of shipping people actually do enjoy talking about their industry and I enjoy talking about it. So you want to have what you hope is a fairly, um, you might have a tough interview, but you also want both sides to sort of feel they've got something out of it. But you don't always know at the beginning where it's going to end up or what the story is going to be. And that's what I feel a bit concerned about. If they feel too constrained, they've got just got to stick to A, B, C and D and not veer off that path. We as journalists are just going to have a very dull time. And I think the readers will. So it's, it's really what, what you want and where where what both sides expect to get out of it. And I, I would agree with that. I would just so it's very different talking to respect to journalists like yourself, Janet, and on a, a title that gets their business to someone who's got five minutes writing about this topic very quickly today and moving on to something. It's very, it's a very daunting prospect for for the executive sitting there going, "Oh my goodness, I've now got to try and explain this really complicated thing to someone who doesn't get it," and uh, I'm, I feel very uncomfortable in that position. And that's where they, you know, everybody needs to be properly be briefed and every, you know, all the background briefing and all of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes ahead of, ahead of that interview is, is, is what's needed. And that's where we try and give as much support as possible. Um, but it is a, it is a challenge. It is absolutely a challenge. Um, no, I, accept, I accept that it is difficult. And, but I think what, I think all CEOs should be prepared to go in front of a camera if something happens. I mean, there's an <laughs> the recent event that we both know um, ever given. You know, everyone should have been prepared to stand up, even if they didn't have anything to say that was, you know, that even if they didn't know what had happened. I think, you know, there was a fair amount of criticism in Lloyd's List about the fact we didn't really see the, the CEOs standing up and saying, you know, really regret we've had this accident, we'll try to find out what happened. It doesn't matter, even if it's fairly bland, but I do think this is where shipping uh, makes a mistake. A lot of 
CEOs are not prepared to literally stand up in front of cameras, radio or the trade press when they need to be seen. And I think that's where, you know, when my people get suspicious about shipping, what, why is it hiding? Why can't we see these people? Um, I don't know whether you train your, your clients or you tell your clients they should be visible, but I think that is part of the problem for the um, for all the press. Well, we do, we do, absolutely. And if you don't, you know, if you don't stand up and speak, someone else is going to speak on your behalf. Everybody knows that. If you, someone else is going to fill the void. Um, mm. And, um, but it is also, yeah, it, I don't want to go into the, the details of any particular incident, but of course there's lots of parties involved and those that you might think should be standing up and speaking would love to, they might not necessarily have the authority to do so because of the other parties involved. You know, they might be, you know, at the end of the day, it's like who, who is able to speak on behalf of this? You know, this, who has ownership of this whole, this whole incident? But that's, that's going down another another route but it's, well not in a way i mean if i could just intervene for a minute let's take an incident we won't name it but an incident when you've got the ship owned by one in one com or one company in one country and chartered elsewhere and managed elsewhere and flagged elsewhere and classed elsewhere and crewed elsewhere there should be a plan you know because you don't know shipping things happen you don't know when and you hopefully it won't but it just might and that all should be prepared in advance, surely. From a communications point of view, there should surely be a plan in just in case the worst happens. And I don't know what you advise your clients, but that's what I would expect yeah, as a journalist. There, there is, there are all, all our clients have a plan, absolutely. I think, I think it's an interesting point, and I'm sure, um, I'm sure that most sort of significant players within the sector do have media media plans when there is a casualty, but it feeds into one of the questions that was was raised in the in the chat by Stephen Jones, and of course there is that structural issue, uh, which which sort of facilitates, uh, you know, broad sweeping statements, if you like, is that you know when there is a casualty, uh, there is an ultimately there's a claim, uh, and people are very anxious about what they say publicly. Um, because they don't want to in any way affect that ongoing investigation. Uh, and again, I'm sure this is something that is you not unique to shipping, quite frankly. I'm sure this occurs in all other industries. Um, but it does, it does represent a structural issue. And I suppose it means that when uh, incidents and casualties do occur, the stakeholders involved in that casualty are somewhat constrained. And that might be frustrating to, to journalists, I suppose. But that's a that's a sort of uh, inherent tension, isn't it? Ben, but I don't I think, know whether you want to come on this. That's a frustration to PR people as well, because ultimately, if, if you get hit by a crisis, that is when you find out the true character of an organisation and the people who run it. So it's absolutely, in my view, essential that if you get, and if COVID has taught us anything, that the management comes out, senior management, and shows empathy, shows that they're thinking about the human um, effect of whatever has happened. Um, that is, to me, fundamental to public relations. Um, you, you, you really have to stand up and be counted um, at a time of crisis. I think, um... I think one of the things that this is leading to, and it's interesting, we, we started off this conversation talking about, I suppose, to coin a phrase, the issue of sea blindness within uh, the wider uh, society and within the wider press, etc. And I don't think there's any doubt, um, and as Bill and as Bill put forward in his earlier slide, there's any doubt that there is an enhanced awareness of the shipping industry and the importance of the shipping industry within the global supply chain, within uh, the wider society. Um, and I think I think my question is, I suppose, in in that context, how do companies within the sector harness that enhanced interest? Uh, to support their commercial objectives? And, and Bill, I'll, I'll start with you on that one. Um, it's a good question because not every company in the maritime sector is a shipping company. Most aren't. Most are providing services to ship owners, to charterers, physical services, professional services. Um, and to what extent can they, can they benefit from uh, 
a greater awareness of, of ships and what they do and how they work and the services they require, the impact they have on the environment, etc., is, is is an important one because you know companies often do have something interesting to say and to tell. And they're able to provide color to the to the to the bigger story. They're able to provide some some evidence or some some in, insight and some some information into that. So I think there is an opportunity for smaller companies to, to, to be to, to, to benefit from this. They've just got to really align what they're trying to say with what's what the public's interested in. Can you align what you're doing, the thing that you're involved with as a as a company, to to what's happening out there, what's on the news agenda at the moment? It may or may not be possible. But that's that's the trick of the game is trying to do that, whether it's at a local or an international level, uh, is there a way of harnessing that 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 interest? Yeah, um, absolutely. Marcus, you want to you want to come in there? Yeah, sorry. Um, I was just going to pick up on what Bill said there about there about the smaller companies. I can think of some examples of smaller companies here in this part of the world, so Singapore and elsewhere in Asia, who have sort of quite successfully kind of make themselves the go-to people to talk to about particular sectors of the industry, say the offshore sector or something, and they can actually be quite small companies. But by, by the person being open, the person who runs it, and often they, they might just be a pri private concern in this case, um, they become they become actually quite well known, certainly within the trade press. And even the, then when something major happens, they are the people that the mainstream press goes to because they look, they look through other articles and they say, ah, oh, this person talks, um, I'll call him up. So it, it can, you, by sort of facilitating that type of conversation, a smaller company can get relatively good publicity. And that's a really interesting point, isn't it? Uh, and I think it's I think it's fair to say it's it, it, it goes back to what we were discussing earlier about engagement with the mainstream media is. And we've seen this uh, throughout this year, actually, on certain issues. Um, the media naturally pick up on those people who are most willing to speak. Uh, and not always are those people best placed or, or most informed to be speaking on that particular subject, which does create that imperative for stakeholders that I suppose are directly exposed to an issue to be comfortable engaging with the press to ensure they can set the record straight. Um, because I think we've seen this and, you know, we see this at Maritime London. We get producers ringing us up with two minutes notice asking us to speak on this, that and the other. Uh, and quite often, to be perfectly honest, we're, we're totally the wrong organisation to be speaking on it. But uh, if we were to pick up the, you know, respond to an interview, etc., you bet your bottom dollar that suddenly uh, that phone will keep on ringing. Uh, and that does create that incentive, I suppose, for, for stakeholders to engage proactively. Ben, I don't know, you're having some internet connectivity. Yeah, I had problems, some tech issues um, there, so I was all set to go with an answer. <laughs> okay, well, I'll leave you to get up to speed, but Janet, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you on that one. Yeah, no, I think Marcus has raised a really, really um, good point. People in shipping, the ship owners, probably know more about what's going on in the global economy earlier than just about anybody else because they're handling the goods. They could be fantastic economic commentators. And if they get comfortable instead of just talking, just commenting on world trade or, or congestion or whatever, not talking about their companies, but talking about what they see in the marketplace, A, they're getting visibility. B, they're getting comfortable with being commentators. And, and also, I mean, it's, you know, they, they are more, um, and so I think they, I think you can know if you follow shipping, you know what's happening well before you start to read about it in the, in the, the uh, mainstream financial press when you see, you know, latest trade stats coming up because they're already handling the goods. So I think that's a very good way of um, people in the shipping industry getting their names out without actually having to ask or answer awkward questions or answer questions about their own company. They're talking about the marketplace. Yeah, I, I, I would I would agree entirely with that. And there are lots of, you know, there are some companies that are really good at that and able to provide that sort of information, provide that commentary, feel, feel comfortable with that. There's also things which are completely much more available that weren't before, things like services like um, marine traffic, for example. You know, you can just track what the vessels are doing. People, it's much easier to, to get the visuals, to get a bit of commentary, um, you know, to, to make a story out of, you know, what does shipping tell us about the global economy? I think it's, it's so much easier to do today. And there isn't really, you know, isn't any excuse not to do it.
sorry, I just realised I'm on silent. Uh, I would say I think there's um, I think there's significant consensus here that uh, there is a significant change within the uh, PR landscape within the shipping industry. Uh, and I suppose my question to to all of you is, uh, you know, given London and the UK's strength in uh, media and PR, what's our what's our role moving forward in all of this? Uh, particularly as it becomes increasingly virtual in the way that we consume news. And uh, Janet, I'll start with you there, and then go on to Marcus, who of course is uh, in another shipping hub uh, at the other side of the world. But Janet, I'll start with you. Do you mean London as a shipping centre? What's what is its role? Um, I think um, I think London as a as a hub for for news and PR related services within the sector. Yes, I mean my my issue in a way with London. Obviously, it is a big. Let's talk about London as a maritime centre, but the problem is London doesn't have a, a sort of ship owners at its heart, I think it's a big weakness, um, as opposed to say Singapore. But I mean, we used to, um, since P&O got um, broken up and sold off, there's no um, household name shipping company. And I think that is a big drawback because even though we all know that there's a lot of maritime activities in London, most people outside of our little community, I mean, talking in the UK, are not aware that London is a sort of big shipping center, a big shipping hub. Um, Having said that, I mean, obviously, it's got most of the press and sort of the trade press as sort of tend to be London focused, London based, and that must help to help get you know, get the relationship and get those um, communications going. But I don't really know um, what to say. Well, I've got the IMO here as well, which all helps, but I, I'm not really sure what London or what London can do to sort of um, promote the whole maritime field further so i'm sorry it's not a very clear answer no. but i'm not really sure i think that's i think that's fine bill have you got anything to, to add there i suppose um it's, it's a difficult one isn't it i mean i'm a londoner born and bred i love london i'm based here in london i've chosen to base my business here and, and build a build a business around the idea that i'm at the center of a, a leading maritime hub so i think it's you know it's a great place to to, to be based uh, time zone wise language wise expertise wise you know you've got to be somewhere um i, I couldn't think of a better place in europe to be um but you know i'm, I'm biased and i think um i think we've covered a lot of this off already in the webinar and unfortunately i think we've we've lost ben um i think we might have lost him for the duration now unfortunately but um i suppose to conclude uh in this fast changing world and we've got a lot of uh clients on the on the call today if you like and consumers of of news on the call obviously what are your um what are your top tips for those people who are looking to review and evolve their pr strategies uh in light of what's occurred uh over the last uh, 12 to 18 months um and janet i'll, I'll start with you there I do think shipping's got a good story to tell. It always has, actually. It's got a great story to tell. It's kept the global economy going. Um, the it is it is invisible, but I think it's got to. And actually, to be fair, there are a lot of documentaries about big ships and things like that. So they are getting better. The industry is getting better at making itself more transparent or more visible. Um, it's just not. It shouldn't be afraid because it has got a good story to tell. Get to know the journalists. We're quite nice mostly. There might be tough times if there's an incident. You. Um, well, to be honest, if you're in a major accident, okay, you're involved in a major casualty, but you already know the journalist, it's definitely an advantage. You know, don't start to build your media relationships and, you know, when there's an accident or something. Make sure you already know the journalist you want to talk to. Know the journalist who you think will understand and listen and get the story right. And I think that's the most important thing. You want to, be, you want to have accurate information reported, hopefully, well. And that means having those relationships with journalists already established. Yeah, absolutely. Um, ben, did you did you get that question? I see you've. I, I, I didn't. I'm afraid. No, no, that's all right. I was just saying uh, we've we've obviously well we're now over time uh, yeah. on the webinar, but just to conclude, I was saying that you know uh, as as companies look to evolve their PR strategies to take into account what's happened over over the last year or so, uh, what would be your your top tips for them? Well, I think, you know, 
as I think has been said er earlier, you've got to find the human stories within your business. You've got to find a purpose within your business that is more than what you do, a higher purpose, um, and have an ethos that really resonates. I mean, you think about Apple and the Think Different campaign and how they celebrated Gandhi and Lenin as people who thought different and thought they could change the world were those that did. and. This sort of said something about the attitude and um, the outlook of people within the business. And I've seen it in companies that we've worked with, um, Camel Led Shipbuilders, for example. Um, their, their leaders were incredibly passionate about um, creating jobs and creating work for local people and bringing pride back to the area. And I think, you know, it's finding that human story. You can't just have PR buried remotely. Um, you've got to have it fundamental to the organization. So you're always thinking about, you know, the story that you want to tell and finding those stories of triumph and adversity overcome. I mean, you know, maritime is steeped with this stuff. Uh, and that's the frustration sometimes that we're sitting on this mountain of, of value. And we just got to unleash it because we've got better stories to tell in virtually any sector in the world. I mean, you know, going to visit a port or a shipbuild as compared to going to a data center. I mean, I know what I'd rather do. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, completely uh, agree. Marcus, Marcus, over to you. Oh, I couldn't agree more about visiting a port versus a data center. But, uh, <laughs> I, I think in terms of media strategy, essentially, what I say is actually have one. Uh, and that might sound a bit glib, but what I mean is actually understand why it is you want to engage the media and, why, and what it is you're actually trying to get out of this. Uh, I've, got a pre I've actually gone to press conferences where they've literally been held for the sake of holding a press conference. And there seems to be no actual objective except to sort of allow people to witter on for a while. You've got to understand what it is you're trying to get across and why. And you know, that could be uh, for the environmental agenda. You want to influence what's going to happen going forward by being seen to be a leader uh, in what you're doing. Um, it can be the human angle, as Ben was saying there, sharing there, very much that, so, particularly in the last year of the crew change crisis, bringing that human angle in, letting people understand what this industry is about, the people who work in it. Um, or actually just being kind of like a thought leader um, and someone who you know, knows what's happening in the world economy. You know, These are the go-to guys who understand the inner workings of what's happening with trade. And so I think if you can get that strategy set in place and then work out who you want to talk to and engage and all that, then, yeah. Uh, I, think, I think you've hit on a really interesting point there, Marcus. Uh, and we haven't, we haven't perhaps covered it in enough detail uh, in this webinar. And we're now well over time. But that piece about thought leadership and actually you showcase your expertise by being willing and able to comment uh, in an educated manner on what is going on within the industry. Uh, and in many ways, that is the best way to get your message across. It's far more important than just reeling out stats and statistics about your business, etc. It's about having something useful to say when it needs to be said. Uh, and perhaps the, the industry as a whole needs to be more, com more, more willing to come forward to provide that commentary uh, when it is required of them. But Bill, I don't know, uh, I'll, 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 I'll pass that over to you. Um, I'll keep it simple and I'll say, keep it simple. Keep mm. it simple. Don't yeah. over elaborate, keep it simple. Well, I think this, we've, had a, we've had a glut of messages come in uh, over the last couple of minutes, which unfortunately uh, we're not going to be able to cover off in their entirety. But I think it's fair to say that many of them, we have already captured the essence in what has been discussed today. Uh, and I think this has been a really interesting discussion. Um, and as I think there has been a, almost total alignment in the fact that, you know, significant things have changed uh, over the past 12 to 18 months in terms of how the shipping industry utilises PR to its own advantage. I think that there is still a significant road to go down and some difficulties as we as we work uh, as we work through that as well. But uh, I think this has been a really interesting conversation uh, and maybe we should sort of reconvene at some point in the not too distant future just to see how this this sort of issue progresses uh, and how the industry uh, communicates with the wider world as we move out of the 
pandemic, of course, which I think, uh, you know, represents a significant opportunity for the shipping industry. But for now, I'd like to thank all of our panelists who have done a, uh, who, have, who have provide a really interesting insight uh, into what's occurred over the past uh, 12 to 18 months and what the future may hold. Uh, and, and thanks to Ben, who has, you know, uh, stayed with us manfully uh, as he struggled with internet access, etc. And thank you for, you know, uh, rejoining the call. It's been much appreciated. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, all of the listeners for being here today uh, and hope you have a very good rest of the day. So thanks very much. And Janet, enjoy enjoy the balance of your holiday and thanks for joining us. <laughs> I will. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.